Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Rajesh Merchandani. I'm the Chief Communications Officer of the United Nations Foundation. Um, and, you know, just you being here shows your commitment, your recommitment to human rights. And today, as we know, is the perfect day to do that. Seventy years ago today, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted at the UN with its famous uh, Article 1, the opening clause, all human beings are created equal in dignity and respect. Uh, I think it's still so relevant, so powerful today. I mean, would you disagree that that says, that speaks to us all today more than it ever has almost? So whatever particular issue that you've come here with today, whatever you're most passionate about, the thing about the Universal Declaration, copies of which are sitting on all your tables, is that every issue is in there because every issue is connected and they're all connected through the lens of human rights and that's a really important thing to remember. We can't make progress as a world if we don't have rights and rights that we can exercise and enjoy. It's not enough just to have them, we have to be able to use them as well. Um, now, as I said, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was created at the forum of the UN uh, and only the UN has the mandate, the capacity, the scale, the scope, the range uh, to promote, protect and extend human rights to everyone, everywhere. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I'm proud to work for the United Nations Foundation. We were set up 20 years ago to mobilize ideas, people and resources to help the UN drive global progress and to tackle urgent problems. Um, so I'm really proud to be here today. Uh, I lived in LA for five years. I'm so happy to be back uh, here at City Hall. We're super proud to be partnering with the office of the mayor of LA. Uh, and also with the UN's Human Rights Office uh, as well. And this afternoon, we're also going to involve all of you to think about uh, human rights issues that are local, but also global. And to showcase solutions and to celebrate some young activists uh, who are going to be making the change that we all want to see. Um, we have a fabulous panel as well. I'll introduce them in a couple of minutes. Uh, they bring the most incredible array of skills and huge depth of experience, and they're going to be helping us think through some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. So how is this afternoon going to work? The idea is that it's fun and relaxed, and we want to get you guys involved. We're going to give you a taste of some human rights challenges in a few issue areas, including homelessness, gender equality, LGBTQ rights, technology, uh, and rights for uh, migrants and immigrants. And from hundreds of candidates from, the, from this area, we found five great young human rights ambassadors. And they're going to be up here, and they're going to lay out the challenges and their ideas to address them. And then once our human rights ambassadors have presented their ideas, our panel is going to give them their collective decades of experience uh, to go away and consider them more. Uh, and then after that, we're going to turn it over to you guys. This is going to be an inter interactive uh, afternoon. Our human rights ambassadors are going to come and sit with you and they're going to lead a discussion on your tables about the issues that they have presented to see what challenges you come up with and what solutions you can identify uh, as well. That's not all. Today's Human Rights Day. Downstairs we have a video wall. We want you to go down there and we want you to take the pledge for human rights at the end of the afternoon. So please remember to do that throughout. Please also get busy on social. Stand up for human rights is the hashtag today. It's already trending. Let's keep that going. Uh, and the other hashtags we want you to use, they should be in your folders on your table. So check them out. Please make sure that you tag us, una.usa, on everything that you post. And there's several other hashtags too, including UN Human Rights uh, as well and at Mayor of LA. Um, and we're going to get you to tap into your inner designers. Maybe they're not just inner designers. Maybe that's what you want to do. Uh, take a look at some of the... The, the bags that we've got here with the candles inside. We've designed some ideas about how to stand up for human rights and to shine a light for human rights. And at the end of the afternoon, we're gonna get you to get creative and design some of these bags as well to add to our display. So you get to be artists too. So there is a lot going on. I wanna now invite up a couple of amazing speakers, people doing really, really important work in the human rights space here and globally. In a few minutes' time, I'm going to invite the Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN, Kate Gilmore, to come up and speak. But first of all, I'm going to invite the LA City Deputy Mayor for International Affairs, Nina Hachigian, to, get, uh, to say a few words. She worked for President Obama and President Bill Clinton and was appointed by Mayor Garcetti to this role in 2017. So please welcome Deputy Mayor Nina Hachigian. <laughs> Uh, 
Hello, everybody. On behalf of Eric Garcetti, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to City Hall. Uh, you are the next globally minded generation of leaders. We need all of you. Um, and we're so happy that you came from all corners of the city and thank you for taking the time off to be with us today. I wanna to start by thanking Kate Gilmore and the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, USC, and the entire team at the UN Foundation and the UNA USA for your partnership in making this whole day possible. Um, we're really honored to be the place that you selected to celebrate the 70th birthday of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I don't think there's any place better to commemorate this day than with you young Angelinos who are determined to build a more sustainable, more prosperous and more fair future for all the people in our city and in our world. You're the social justice generation, more empathetic, more accepting, <coughs> and each day people like you inspire me with the depth of your compassion and your awareness of the issues in your city and in the world. You fight for your rights and for those of your neighbors, friends and classmates. You reject outdated labels that divide us and you call out discrimination in all its forms. I've seen that over and over. And while I may have been born a very long time ago, uh, I was your age when I first became interested in human rights. Whether it was traveling to Afghanistan to study the use of landmines and documenting apartheid South Africa, as I did in my 20s, or serving as an ambassador under President Obama, those universal rights gave me the direction and were the central values that I've always um, come back to. I haven't carried it in my pocketbook like our mayor used to carry it in his wallet, but I still value that document and, and turn to it often. But I'm really uh, thrilled now to get to be uh, serving this mayor uh, in this city who really understands that human rights and the sustainable development goals start here in our own backyard. As Mayor Garcetti said recently, the sustainable development goals are not just about international diplomacy and development or just about far off places facing far different obstacles, they're about us. Cities have to be leaders and problem solvers, that's our job. Uh, equity and ensuring that all Angelinos have opportunities is the key lens that we use in Los Angeles as we develop solutions. Government um, has a key role. We turn mobilization into policy, enshrining the rights that we seek in our legal structures because, as the previous speaker said, without protections for rights, they aren't meaningful. So I'm gonna give you just a few recent examples uh, about what cities can do, uh, because now over half of humanity lives in cities and they, we have a key role in, in protecting rights. I'll give you a few examples from Los Angeles. So we recently created the LA Justice Fund. It's a $10 million fund that provides legal assistance to people facing deportation, including children and families separated by federal policies. Our city was one of the first to adopt the UN, the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, in August 2015 as part of Mayor Garcetti's executive directive. He called on every city department to help Los Angeles fulfill its responsibilities under the convention. And I could go on and on about all that he has done for gender equity in our city. It's really impressive. Every single city department had to have a plan. Uh, to ensure gender equity. And for the first time in LA's history, we have gender parity on all 41 city boards and commissions. As of September, women hold more than 50% of these positions and there are no longer any all male commissions. Uh, more than half of the deputy mayors in Los Angeles are women. And uh, we, have, uh, we have teams that, that uh, address domestic violence in all of the city precincts around Los Angeles. And when we consider how to measure gender parity as part of sustainable development goal number five, we plan to reword the targets to ensure that we have non-binary gender equity targets as well and add targets around LGBTQ rights, something that is absent from the SDG framework as it was adopted by the United Nations. But that's something that we here in Los Angeles can do. We understand that diversity in thought and representation is critical to finding innovative and effective solutions to our city's toughest challenges. 
we are as a city, we're proud of being number one in a lot of different areas, solar panels, tech jobs, infrastructure, tourism, entertainment, manufacturing output, foreign investment. But we're also number one in ways that we don't want to be. We have more homeless here than anywhere in the United States. And it's a very complicated problem. No one solution fits for every individual, but we are making progress and we're working very hard on this challenge. We have provided permanent housing to more than 32,000 homeless people over the last four years, which is a faster pace of progress than any other city. And through our program called the Bridge Home, we're building emergency shelter um, all around the city, complete with wraparound services that various individuals need, uh, job, job counseling, um, drug treatment, many others. But we're not gonna stop until we've met our goal of making sure that everyone in our city has safety and shelter. That's going to require all the tools in our toolbox. It's going to require each of us doing our part and I'm looking forward to seeing what kinds of solutions that you come up with today. Environmental justice also has to continue to be a part of our city's work. Climate change disproportionately impacts the communities that are already most vulnerable homeless, low-income families, women, and people of color. Three years ago, Mayor Garcetti launched our Sustainable City Plan and put us on a track to a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2025. He led LA to become the number one solar city in America, and he's committed LA to, to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, which is the most ambitious effort that Los Angeles has ever had to achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. We reduced carbon emissions in 2016 by 11% alone, but at the same time, we're creating thousands and thousands of green jobs, and we have record unemployment in the city. The Port of LA also beat every target it set to reduce its pollution um, by years, and it's continuing that important work. Most importantly, when Mayor Garcetti led his brother and sister mayors around the United States to form a group called Climate Mayors. So there are now over 400 U.S. mayors that have all pledged to continue to stay part of the Paris Agreement. So that's 70 million Americans. So when Washington has stepped away from leadership, stepped away from international engagement, stepped away from the organizations that solve problems like the United States, uh, Los Angeles and cities are stepping in. Mayor Garcetti often likes to say that when you come to LA, you can see the face of the world on our streets. We are a city created from people from all different parts of the globe. And that diversity doesn't weaken us, it doesn't divide us, it has defined us and it strengthens us. We aren't walled municipalities, we are family, we're friends, we're colleagues, we are engaged citizens of a complex world. So I'd like to leave you with a question Eleanor Roosevelt asked 70 years ago which is where, after all, do universal human rights begin? And I hope you'll leave here today and remember her basic truth, that they begin with you. Quote, in small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. So thank you, and I look forward to what you're gonna do today. Thank you. Thank you, Nina Hachigian. Uh, I should say earlier this morning, uh, the first of today's events kicked off at USC, and we're really grateful to Professor Sophia Gruskin at the Institute on Inequalities in Global Health and the whole USC team. Some of you are who are here today, I believe, are you? Very quiet. Let's hear it, let's hear it, Trojans. Are you in the room? Okay, good. good, good. So thank you very much uh, for your help and partnership on that and on this event today. Uh, this morning we heard a rousing speech, remarks from uh, the UN's Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, Kate Gilmore, who started her career as a social worker in Australia, helped set up that country's first center against sexual assault, later joined the UN and was appointed to this lofty office in 2015. And I'm going to invite her now to make some opening remarks to us. Deputy High Commissioner. Thank you. This is very cool. I feel um, somehow my image and reputation is being enhanced just by hanging out with you. 
Like I'm, I'm already feeling like I've got more going on for me <laughs> as a result. It's such a, a joy to have the opportunity of this discussion and uh, with the Deputy Mayor and with Sophia and wonderful colleagues from USCE. Uh, this is a highlight. You know, uh, as the United Nations uh, Office of Human Rights, we had lots of places we could be and should be on the 10th of December in 2018, the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We could have been in lots of places, but only LA would have us. No, that's not true. <laughs> could be true. <laughs> we, oh, I'm just going to step down. We chose, no, we chose, <laughs> I've fallen off the back. We chose to be in LA be, for, yay. <laughs> because we heard you were meeting here and we wanted to have a chance to hang out. We had maybe three things we wanted to say to you. First and foremost, you know, the, the United Nations is simply a gathering place for governments right across the world. I mean, without the UN, what you have are possibilities, I guess, for governments in small groups or one-on-one -on -one to get together and do stuff, to figure stuff out. It's called foreign policy. It's not always a good thing, but you somehow need to figure out how you're going to get on to solve common problems. The great gift of the United Nations, and it's just one of the most recent efforts by countries of the world to hang out together, the great gift of the United Nations is it brings together every single country in the world. There is no other forum that 193 countries, territories, come and meet on a routine and regular basis. And that's precious. That makes of the conversations of the United Nations potentially something that touches every corner of the world. And that's very cool because it means the possibility and the promise of the United Nations is that to the extent that we have problems in common, things that we can only fix by fixing it together, we have a place to come around the table and sort that out. For the United Nations to have a place where every country in the world comes together to talk about human rights, that matters a lot. But Winston Churchill, anyone, like who can, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm just quoting him because he said a cool thing about democracy. He said of democracy, it's just a little less worse than all the other alternatives. The United Nations is just a little less worse than not having the United, don't tell anyone. Like this will be like the last speech I ever give. But I felt because you were so cool and we were up so high, I should be so honest. It's just a little less worse. Imagine not having a place where every country in the world had to come and please explain. Please explain what on earth are you doing to implement the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And remarkably, once, at least once, every four years, every single one of those uh, governments, every single one of those countries comes to Geneva to undergo a process of review and scrutiny of the extent to which they are performing in the spirit and intent of every treaty and obligation that they signed up to. That alone is a remarkable characteristic of our global family as human beings, and it's important. Because it's there that we can have conversations with those in power about their responsibilities to your rights to the rights of the person next to you, to the rights of the person out on the street, the rights of the person over the water, the rights of the person whom you will never meet. This matters. It matters a lot. I want to be very clear. There's a difference between rights and responsibilities. We all have rights. Rights are for the best and for the worst of us. Rights are for each of us to the exclusion of none of us in the interests of all of us. But the more power you have, the more responsibility you have. 
Don't let anybody talk about rights and responsibilities going hand in hand. It's nonsense. It's not true. The more power you have, the more responsibility you have to the rights of others. Hence, governments, the one bunch of dudes who are legitimately able to exercise coercive power, in other words, they have grave responsibilities. They can lock you up or not. They can determine whether you have access to housing or not. They can decide whether or not you will be kept in education when you fall pregnant. And many governments decide they'll chuck you out as a young woman if you're pregnant in secondary school, for example. The more power you have in life, the more responsibilities you have. We all have rights. This is the United Nations. The effort to help promise makers be promise keepers. Second critical thing that brought us to talk with you today, do you know that there are alive today more young people than ever before in all of human history? This is the largest generation in human history of people aged under 25, between the ages of 25 and 10. If being adolescent, being a young person, was a country, be bigger than all of India. And yet, where are young people in decision making, in contribution, in leadership? 90% of young people today are living in the poorest of countries. Anyone know the median age of Uganda? Median age. It's not. You know, do you know median? It's like a bell cut in there. It's that side and that. I go, you know, I think it may, apparently it makes a difference whether it's median or average, but so I'm just going with median, meaning 50% of the population. I'll stop soon if someone would just tell me the median age of Uganda. Nobody? 22. Cool. Cool. Two losers. <laughs> I mean that in a very gentle, caring, and respectful way. No, thank you very much for having a go. You're absolutely, it's not bad, actually. Yes, please, sir. So why have we got three men? 27? Mrs. Google <laughs> just answered that deep, <laughs> challenging question. Median age of Uganda is 15. Median age of Germany. And if, well, I, I feel like I'm <laughs> hammering in something here. It's not bad, it's 47 or so. Median age of Germany, 47. Median age of the US, anyone? 30. Oh, God, I wish I was 30 again. <laughs> you multiply by two, and you get closer to my. No, it doesn't matter, that's another conversation. I'm going to do the old person's event next. No, I'm not. I'll fit in, I know. Come on, median age of the US, it's about 38. Median age of parliamentarians. <laughs> not bad, we're not talking intellectually. <laughs> Chronologically, median age of parliamentarians. Not bad. 53. Think about it. The median age of the poorest country in the world, Niger, 15, 16, Uganda, 15, 16. The median age of countries in conflict, Central Africa Republic, Yemen, South Sudan, not my glasses, uh, Syria. Do you know, without exception, every country in the world today in conflict is aged by median distribution under 25. Today's conflicts are being fought over the bodies the futures and the fates of young people. And not a single commentary on that. Do you know that between them, women and young people account for more than two thirds of people on the move. People displaced by conflict, people fleeing persecution, people being rejected at border after border. People like you, people in your age. It is one of the most hidden aspects of inequality in our world today. The demography of power. 
old people dominating microphones, spending a lot of time talking at you. Oh, hang on. <laughs> it has its place. <laughs> <laughs> Did someone clap? Was that the end? Have I finished? <laughs> So my, my point is, there, if you think about the large population of young people, you think about young people being concentrated in the toughest of places with the least hope, and then you examine the demography of power and opportunity and influence, in other words, young people locked out, at a time when I would say being young is actually a competency, not merely an identity, it's a competency not the least because of what has happened from analog to digital as a transformation of how we handle information and communication. If you put all that together, it is one of the gravest inequalities of our time, one of hidden in plain sight, and one depriving us of talent and creativity. The greatest breakthroughs in technology and science, in maths, in poetry, in music, have all come, almost without exception, from people aged under 30. The guy who invented TV was 14. The guy who invented Braille was 16. Emmeline Pankhurst, who worked on universal suffrage that was celebrated its centenary this year, was 14 when she began. William Wilberforce, who started the campaign against slavery, was 21. Even Einstein, who said you can't solve the world's problems with the same thinking you used to create them, was a young man when he made the breakthroughs for which he is most famous. Today, youth is a competency, and yet youth is not at the table. This is not OK. This is fundamentally not OK. The UN, just a little bit worse than the, the alternatives. Young people locked out. The question becomes, what are you going to do? What should we be doing? And that's why we wanted this conversation. <coughs> Not a conversation about what you need to know about rights at all. A conversation about how will you use rights, your rights, to demand a change that can align the world more closely to your rights. I once, uh, I had the privilege of um, once meeting a, a mother of two. She herself was 14. She had a baby on her lap and a child of three at her knee. The baby on her lap, she explained, came from a relationship with a man who'd become violent and she was in hiding from him, nursing the baby. The child aged three, remember she's 14, Age three was a product of rape at the hands of her uncle. She told me her short life's story. She said, um, when I found out I was pregnant at the age of 10, I went to a clinic to see if I might have the pregnancy terminated, age 10. They threatened her with imprisonment for even asking about abortion. She cried throughout the story. She cried for the cruelty of the men who should have loved her, her uncle and her partner. She cried for the faceless government who cared just so little for her 10-year-old body and for her as a 10-year-old. And she cried because she wanted to stay in school. She wanted to be a nurse. She had dreams. It was enormously painful to listen to a 14-year-old mother, a child mother. But she explained, I am telling you my story because people like you can make a difference. People like you can decide to behave and act and change so that no other girl need ever go through what I've gone through. At 14, that child mother had a deep fire in her, the fire of pain and betrayal 
but she had a very strong understanding of what she wanted to do with that fire. I'm just asking what burns in you? Where's your fire? What are you going to do with it? As I came up the stairs this afternoon, I counted 36 portraits, 36 extraordinary paintings of people of power and influence. Did any of you notice them? Did you notice anything about them? 36 portraits celebrating power and influence. Not a single woman amongst them. Not a single person with disabilities. Only one person of African descent and one Latino descendant. Power is to be challenged. It has to be transformed. And our job is to make a difference. It doesn't necessarily come from knowledge. It does come from knowing what questions to ask. Ask good human rights questions. Be good human rights challenges. You deserve to be at the table of demand for explanation from old people like me who should learn to shut up a lot earlier than they do. Goodbye. <laughs>
Hello, my name is Sophia Rubo. I'm a junior at Westridge School for Girls in Pasadena, and I am the Gender Equality Human Rights Youth Ambassador. I am so grateful to have this opportunity to speak with you today. As a young woman growing up in this world, gender equality is something that is very important to me. And as a high school student at an all-girls school, I'm fortunate to be constantly surrounded by strong, ambitious women. At my school, we have the privilege of being educated in a setting removed from the sexism inherent in our society. However, when we leave our safe haven, the struggles that women face today are more apparent. We are incredibly lucky that we live in Los Angeles. However, there are still several challenges that women here face regarding gender equality. I believe that there are three key ways in which we can increase gender equality in Los Angeles. Firstly, increasing economic autonomy for low-income immigrant women. Secondly, creating more opportunities for women and girls in educational environments. And thirdly, fostering more discussion about issues regarding gender. Firstly, financial autonomy for low-income immigrant women is an economic empowerment and safety issue for women in the United States in the greater Los Angeles area. For example, statistically, women in low-income immigrant communities are more likely are less likely to report instances of domestic violence. This is due to a variety of factors. However, a main contributor to this issue is that many women lack financial autonomy needed to escape abusive partners. Domestic abusers usually begin abusing their partners out of a desire to exert control. This normally manifests itself in the abuser trying to control the victim's finances and to prevent economic independence. Women in low-income communities are more likely to be economically reliant on partners, which leads to a decrease in reporting, because when women that do fi depend financially upon their abusive partners uh, report their partners, they are more likely to lose their livelihoods. In order to address this issue, I propose offering English and career development classes for women in low-income immigrant communities. This goes without saying, but in the United States, you are much more likely to be employed if you speak English. By giving women who don't speak English the opportunity to learn English, we would, we would be providing them with a tool that would increase their likelihood of employment and su support success and other aspects of their lives. Additionally, we should offer classes on career development and teach women about financial literacy. For example, how to open bank accounts and how to manage and save money. Since the solution would be to specifically targeted to women who do not have financial autonomy and may be experiencing domestic abuse, these classes would need to be in safe spaces where women could go without raising suspicious. Places of religious worship, local high schools and elementary schools, libraries and women's shelters would all be good places to hold such classes. By doing this, we would be helping women obtain valuable skills that would increase their likelihood of employment and thus their economic autonomy. Secondly, women and girls face sexism in school. Societal expectations push young girls away from STEM. In order to help mitigate this issue, we should create more all-female environments in our schools. As someone who goes to an all-girls school, I can personally attest to the benefits that an all-female environment provides. Studies have shown that when girls are placed in all-female environments, they are, they are more likely to participate, take risk, and pursue the subject or activity being learned. By creating all-female coding classes and STEM classes, as well as after-school activities involving science within co-educational environments, we will give girls the opportunity to excel in STEM and to see other girls excelling in STEM without facing the sexism that can exist in traditional school environments. Finally, gender equality is something that is prevalent in all aspects of society and life. That makes addressing gender equality a very challenging issue. However, by simply fostering discussion about gender equality and the barriers that women face, as well as gender non-conforming people, we can create change because we will get people thinking about the issue. Talk about gender equality with your friends and family. Ask the women in your lives about their experiences with gender inequality. If someone makes a sexist joke or a sexist comment, call them out on it and tell them why they shouldn't say things like that. By simply having a conversation with someone about gender inequality, you help to improve the situation. Lastly, to the women in the room, I encourage you to support each other. There is often this mindset that there is only enough room for one of us at the top. However, this is not true. When we support each other and when we are there for other women, we all move forward. 
So please, support the women in your life, listen to their experiences, and discuss. Thank you. Sure. Does this work? Oh, look at that. <laughs> um, wow. I actually had listened to your presentation prior to today, and I noticed some ch um, some distinct changes that you had made. And well done. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> because those, those were some of the comments I was going to have. But first and foremost, I am really impressed by just how comprehensive and, and deep you really went in the fact that you looked at the issue from multiple points of view, from a community level, um, from an educational standpoint, and then also just the simplicity of the fact that we're all human beings that can just start a conversation and that every single person can do something. So I, I really appreciated that. The only um, thought that I would want to offer is the idea of where do men fit into the yeah. conversation, um, because not just as allies, but just in general, I would be interested in your perspective. Um, we all very much know that it's really important to move girls, especially, I mean, I think it's 66 million adolescent girls that currently aren't in school. We need to fix that, and there's a lot of things that we need to do, but I also want to make sure that, especially for young leaders like yourself, that you are bringing that forward and helping so that men don't feel excluded and feel a part of the conversation of gender equality as well. But overall, I thought your presentation was excellent. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much for including all women in your presentation, especially uh, low-income women, uh, immigrant women, etc. cetera. Uh, I think my comment is that uh, this is such an important issue in today's world, and I love to quote Coretta Scott King, who said, we will never have peace in the world until women take power. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I have amended that to say feminists, okay? <laughs> because that includes all the guys in the room, okay, because I know, I know all the men here are feminists. Um, but the other thing, uh, because we know that this is um, when we think of domestic violence and violence in general throughout the world, and I, I heard a statistic this week that 137 women in the United States get killed every single day by someone they know. Somebody in their family, relative, boyfriend, husband, etc. Uh, so we know that the objectification of women uh, is still a really big issue that has to be addressed. And it has to start being addressed at the educational level, uh, starting with preschool, with preschools that, that women need to be respected. And the other thing that I think is just like the elephant in the room is that uh, the United States of America, that our Senate has not yet ratified the Convention for uh, Equal Rights for Women, CEDA. It has not been ratified, and when we are supposed to be uh, one of the leading countries in human rights, and that we have not, in our United States Senate, ratified the Convention uh, for Equal Rights for Women. I think it's something that we all have to look at. And, and some people say, well, you know, there's countries, but there's only a couple of countries, I think, uh, maybe three or four that have not ratified this uh, convention, uh, or, you know, setting the framework and the, and the law for women to be treated equally. Uh, but we are uh, a nation of laws. Some people, some people say, well, other countries have ratified the convention, but they don't, really, uh, they don't really honor women or respect women. But we are a nation of laws. And if we have that as, as a framework, as a principle, as a philosophy, then I think that would go a long way uh, to make sure that women get equal treatment. Si se puede. Thank you. Um, yeah, when you talked about including men in the conversation, I think that my last point, this is men, like ask the women in your lives about how they experience sexism because you, you can't know what it's like until you have someone tell, tell you their story. And I know like I love it when guys ask me about how I've experienced sexism. And I think that just by asking people, talking to people, like you increase your awareness so much. And I think that 
we really need to have more conversations, not just with women, but with men. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Leo Tafoya, a high school senior at the California Academy of Mathematics and Science, an active volunteer, an avid believer in the protection and progression of human rights for any and all people. Today I'm here to talk to you all about the invisible population, the 1.56 million people in the United States living in poverty and homelessness who somehow go unseen. They're not in hiding, but something about our society tucks them into the far corners of our brain. Now it's important to clarify that by invisible, I do not mean transparent. You've probably seen them in tents sprawled across sidewalks, sitting on the curb asking for spare change, and I can take a guess that you saw some on your way here today. So why are they called the invisible population? Because while their headcount is enough to justify the title of population, they experience utter neglect and lack of consideration for the rights that belong to every human. The 31,516 people in Los Angeles, California, who experience homelessness include adults and children of all sexualities, ethnicities, religions, and backgrounds. This started so well, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, and because of, this, because of the stigma their society has created, labeling these people as dirty and lazy, they're tossed to the side, left living day by day on the sidewalks they call home. Oftentimes, I think people underestimate the severity of the situation. They don't have anywhere to live. So what? Why don't they get a job? Our, Scope of consideration for these people probably lasts as long as we can see them while we drive past. But this leaves out some very serious, uh, some very serious issues that they encounter every day but we take for granted. Let's consider the most basic of necessities, food, water, and shelter. Shelter, obviously out of the question, right? Food, you need money for food, and for money you need to get a job, which is also oftentimes out of the question because they don't have access to a wardrobe, showers, or transportation. Water. This one sounds easy. A bottle of water costs money, but if you walk into Starbucks and ask for a cup of water, it's free. The issue comes when store owners and managers call the police on the crazy homeless, the crazy homeless man that just walked into their store. Why do I care? I care because I hold the belief that everyone on this earth is entitled to the pursuit of happiness. No single person shall lack the basic necessities that are needed to progress in life and move up our socioeconomic ladder. About one in four homeless people suffer from mental illness, an uh, understandable fact considering the life they're left to live. About one in three people, about one in three people struggling from homelessness also struggle from drug addiction, again, another unfortunate but understandable fact. And about nine in 10 women experience sexual or physical abuse while experiencing homelessness. The thing about homelessness is that there is no one definitive end all be all solution, but there are things we can do and resources we can provide to help those in need. Ra uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. I propose offering more hybrid facilities that tackle, many, that tackle multiple of these uh, prominent issues, such as mental health and drug addiction, under one roof. Rather than just a soup kitchen or just a drug rehab center, how about offering more resource centers that tackle multiple under one roof? I just said that, okay. <laughs> In these facilities, new and returning people would, would be able to get the help they need. Imagine being able to go to a facility where you get a full meal, regular rehabilitation services, career counseling, and access to donated clothes and a shower for a job interview later that day. The immediate quantitative and qualitative difference in people's lives would be in, eh, unignorable. <laughs> I'm sorry, I am a very awkward person, uh, if you have not caught on by now. <laughs> Thank you. Los Angeles has taken great strides in working towards solutions as well, like through Measure H which over the next 10 years will raise $3.55 billion towards helping the chronically homeless. But ultimately, we hold respons some responsibility to contribute to change as well. I've been involved in trying to help these people for around the past three years, and right now is as good a time as any for you to get involved as well. At the local level, you can see community service organizations, 
Specifically, for the Los Angeles area, there's an organization called the Midnight Mission, which, which aims to help the homeless population living on Skid Row. Oof. The Midnight Mission feeds three meals a day to the overwhelming amount of uh, people living on Skid Row, living in tents on Skid Row. From volunteering with the Midnight Mission, I've been able to gain one-on-one -on -one interactions with these people, get a glimpse into their lives, and see the appreciation they feel towards someone lending a helping hand. There exists the idea that these people are unpredictable in the behavior or dangerous to be around, which again is, a reasonable, is a reasonable thought considering their daily struggles and trust being something they simply can't hold on to. But in the experiences that I've had, I've gone in large groups and in controlled environments and I have had nothing but positive interactions. The, the face of joy I see on, on the people I've encountered once I lend a helping hand is something that I will never forget. I encourage each and every one of you to put yourself in the position of someone living on the forgotten side of humanity. Think about everything around you and ask yourself if it's right and just that those things are not accessible to all. Thank you. I think, Leo, you're on top of a lot of really challenging issues, and I appreciate your being awkward. I don't think you are, but standing up there as you did, I think you did a great job. <laughs> it's you. not easy. <laughs> and, I, and I think you laid out a, a lot of issues we all have to look at, but for me, it comes down to, um, somebody said earlier, the, the quote by my grandmother about human rights. What we, all, what we have to remember when you look at this document, this is the roadmap for everything we want to do, for what you want to do in schools, for what you want to do when you get out of school. And my grandmother said when she was asked about this after 10 years of it being in existence, what, how's it doing? How, what do you think now, Mrs. Roosevelt? And she said, well, after all, it's in your hands. And I, I would say the same thing, it's in your hands. We do what we do in our own work environment, in our life environment, but really, there should not be any of these left on the table today when you leave. And I ask the question as an educator with the issues you raised, why is this not taught in public and private schools across the country? Why is it not mandatory curriculum for you to know how this came into being and how it's used or not used around the country, around the city? And in LA, as she said in her remarks then, where after all do human rights begin? Close to home. Right here, if you walk out of this building three blocks from here, you could see human rights being violated. It doesn't necessarily mean the person living in the tent. It means the person who is shelter challenged or food challenged. In LA Unified, I work within the school district. I provide a nonprofit in the Northeast San Fernando Valley where there are thousands of students who are shelter challenged and food challenged in the district. The LA Unified has 700,000 students in public school, and most of them are Title I eligible. And if you know what that means, it means that you are eligible for free, free breakfast or lunch which means your income prevents you from having access to that. So where does that leave you when you are a person trying to do things like you're trying to do in your community? If you don't know what your rights are, you don't have any. So this document has to be used as an in, in, informative roadmap for what you want to do, what you engage in. So I would challenge you, take every one of the issues you hear today and just do one thing. Mm -hmm. Read all the documents in here. Read all the articles, there's 30. Pick the one that hits your heart. Know it by heart. Memorize it. Join a movement that started years ago to put this document in the passport of every citizen in the world. It's not there. But it should be. So when you pick the issue you've picked, the homelessness and poverty in this country, this doesn't answer it. You can't eat this. It wouldn't be a very good meal. But you need to know it. So I work in the field of education to try to get this in curriculum, to get it in schools so we can understand it. And that starts in preschool. I've run preschools in my earlier career, and I see where those things start, boys, girls, the dynamics of teachers and parents and so on. We got a lot of work to do. I think something uh, that you can add to that conversation is the effect um, on LGBTQI uh, youth I believe up to 40% of youth uh, who are homeless uh, identify as being part of the community um, and supporting programs like the LA LGBT Center. Um, I took a tour over there and 
something that you mentioned, uh, a, a place that has like one-stop shopping where it addresses medical, housing, mm -hmm. uh, career development. Uh, they have it all right there. Mm -hmm. uh, they do a great job of uh, providing a safe space because uh, a lot of uh, youth uh, who are members of the community are looking for that safe space and they just don't know about it. So maybe um, doing something to try to increase awareness that there is this resource, great resource here in Los Angeles for those uh, LGBTQI kids. Uh, so yeah, bringing, going off the, of the issue of the LGBT being part of the big homelessness population, along with that, there's a lot of other big groups that are part of it too. And one of the personal experiences that I've had um, involving like immigrants and people who end up in, in homeless situations when they go into this country seeking the American dream, seeking the pursuit of happiness, is that there was one time when I was serving food to a woman and she couldn't speak English. Uh, the rest, uh, as you can probably imagine, a lot of these shelters and resource centers are understaffed, so there wasn't any other volunteers around me who could communicate with her. So I stepped in, and that moment, in that moment, I kind of had a moment of self-realization where I see, because I'm a child of immigrants, I'm a grandchild of immigrants, I'm like, there are people who come here with the pursuit of happiness, pursuing a better life for themselves and their future children, who oftentimes end up in these situations. So. Um, with that, I kind of ask you guys, like, if you can relate, go out and help your local community, your local shelters and your local soup kitchens, because a lot of times they are understaffed and they can use your help, especially with issues that involve people of different groups that you can relate to. So yeah, just call to action. Go help. <laughs> So just a month ago, I didn't know if I would still have a house. The Hill Fires brutally took the homes of many in my community quite literally hours after a mass shooting took 12 innocent lives from my community. My name is Kavita Rai, I'm a senior at Newbury Park High School in Thousand Oaks, and luckily I was safe. But I remember waiting helplessly for my friends to respond back to me, confirming they were evacuated. I remember the families and, victim, the families and friends of the victims of the borderline shooting helplessly waiting for the status of their loved ones to be updated. Now, while I'm grateful for the role social media played in updating me and confirming me on the proliferating events happening in my community, I know we can do better. Technology can play such an integral role in the development of aid, whether that's the natural and man-made disasters here in the US, or the international development and humanitarian aid that happens in developing countries. Now, I've recognized the role a cellular device can play in a civilian's life. It's no longer a luxury item. It's an item for means of communication, education, and safety. Yet even though it's commonly used throughout the world, it's still hard for families and friends to contact their family members and friends who are in imminent danger. Even though we are constantly globalizing with technology, it's still hard for us to feel like we're making tangible change with humanitarian crises happening across the world. Now the solution I propose today will hopefully be able to circumvent both of these issues to a certain magnitude and also hopefully prevent them. I believe we should be creating a faster communication network through the use of social media maps that will help prevent and alleviate the, the concerns and stresses people face during imminent dangers. Now, taking after Snapchat, I believe all social media should have a social media map. As I'm sure a lot of you do have Snapchat, you might be familiar that there is already a maps component where you can view where your friends, followers, and other users are in relation to you. Nowadays, there's not a single app that doesn't ask for your location. Why not use this for social good? Now, I believe each map should be customized based off of a certain category, a category as simple as language. Now, how could language be relevant to the preservation of human rights? 
Well, let's take an extreme example of an asylum seeker going to a different country for a refugee camp. They will need to know people who speak the same language as them so they're able to communicate. With a social media map that has the category of language, you're able to see the people who speak the same language as you in relation to the proximity of your location. Additionally, this could be a great tool for instant translations. It doesn't have to be an asylum seeker. It could be anyone who needs translation. You would be able to instantly get a translation that's not an artificial intelligence who could often mispronounce cultural terms, but a human base-to-base -base interaction. It's important that when we use technology for social good, we understand that it still is a human base-to-base -base interaction. Everyone has a right to be understood, and everyone has a right to have access to be understood. Now, additionally, I believe these social media maps could be a great way to document hate crimes or sexual-based sexual assaults in a certain area. Users could document anonymously if they've ever witnessed or experienced a certain hate crime in a certain area. This will allow people to understand the types of hate crimes that happen in a certain area and also to avoid it if necessary. Now, going back to the example of natural disasters, in my instance, I was very close to the fires happening in my community. If I had a social media map that automatically synced, me to a loca automatically synced my location, I would be able to change my status from safe to in danger. Now, this not only is important to understand where the evacuation zones are or evacuation centers where I can uh, go to and its proximity to me, but it also leads way to the most integral part of how we can use social media for social good how others can help me, what I can do for them, what they can do for me. It's important to understand that when the status changes to danger, people will, people will understand how they can help me. And it's a very integral part in our society that we understand that empathy must be reintroduced as technology keeps on expanding. Now, I hope to grapple with this idea throughout college and my endeavors with Girl Up. For those of you who don't know, Girl Up is an initiative of the United Nations Foundation that promotes global gender equality and mobilizes girls like me to do social good. And with Girl Up, I want to understand how, one, we can pragmatically develop foreign aid that does not infringe on adolescent girls' agencies, but two, make it sustainable and equitable for all. And I believe technology will be at the forefront of that issue. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to take the first stab at this, but first of all, you did an excellent job, so thank you. Um, I also want to thank all the organizers and the other panelists. I'm sort of blown away by my own presence here. Um, it's such an honor. Um, so, so we do live in this increasingly technologically driven era, and um, going back to what um, the Deputy High Commissioner said at the beginning, youth is, youth is truly a competency, and uniquely so in the realm of technology. I think that most people in this room have sort of this native, intrinsic access to systems that older people, frankly, don't. You grew up playing around with smartphones. You understand how the internet works in ways that others just can't even fathom. Um, it is a remarkable time, and the time is driven by the people in this room. Mm -hmm. So I, do, I, I just wanted to ground the conversation in that fundamental thought, because you all have power beyond generations that have come before you. Um, I love your systems level approach. Um, I think it's so important to think through any social and human rights issue by thinking of sort of the, the bigger picture and the, all of the moving parts involved. And I thought that the, the way that you told your own personal story, having sort of the narrative link to you and then expanding beyond that and making it universal is sort of at the essence of social media and is at the essence of, of the very field that you're trying to conquer. Um, our stories link us. We are all human. We are all diverse and unique, and no one else is definitively like us. But if we share our stories with other people, um, others are going to be more inclined to listen and change. And so um, I think that, that overall, I, I love your concept. I think that many companies, including Snap, um, have played with the idea, but would, I think, benefit from investing more heavily in that. So, so thanks for that. Thank you. Mm. 
not to be the older curmudgeon on the panel, I, I started in the field of education a long time ago, in, in uh, way before these were around, in preschool. I worked, I ran a preschool in the Santa Cruz area. And I, I think a lot of what you're saying is absolutely true. These are invaluable devices. I'm certainly as much of a, a user or abuser of it as anybody, as my kids would tell you. However, I also see that we need to find the space and time when these are not part of our lives to talk to each other one-on-one -on -one or in a small group at your table where this is not interrupting us all the time because that's where the human connection happens. It, yes, it happens on your smart device, on whatever, and that human face-to-face -face connection will address the issues we're talking about here, whether it's poverty, homelessness, abuse, which is rampant around the world, but I think a lot of it can do be documented and should be, but then the face-to-face, -face, put it down and have a real conversation with, whether it's your parents, your partner, your friends, whoever it is that you want to share your values with, do it live with each other. It's, it's really, I think it's really important to remember th there's some level at which these, these take over our lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your call. <laughs> um, uh, I think, um, uh, what you're proposing, I think, is very visionary and probably prophetic because it's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, I think it, uh, uh, with with the wonderful world of uh, uh, communication and the devices, I think it uh, is a way also to unite people and uh, uh, to also spread the knowledge. Uh, because I do believe that one of the ills that we have in our world today is just a lot of ignorance because people don't know. And so I think all of the young people, and I'm very technologically handicapped, uh, being probably the oldest person in the room. <laughs> I'm 88. Uh, sure. so, but I, I, I think that uh, what, your, what, what your statement is, I believe uh, maybe this is the way that the vision of the United Nations can one day uh, come to fruition when the people are united and uh, definitely uh, the devices are one way that not only, as I said before, that can unite people. So I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say that, again, technology is supposed to be a tool, not a replacement for human-based based interaction. And I think the panelists bring a very good point, is that sometimes we do need to understand that there is a point where you put it down and have those conversations. But social media is a great way to elevate those, con those conversations. I mean, as a Gen Z, we have seen social media-led movements just led by a simple hashtag. And it's important to understand that we have a voice, especially with the use of technology, and we need to use it. Thank you. Yes. My name is Angela. I am a sophomore at Geffen Academy at UCLA, and I am here to talk about immigrants and refugees as a human. Mm. Now, to be human seems simple. Just to exist, to breathe, to be. Simple, right? Yet, according to the continued separating of families, the violence held against those who were, and the stigma surrounding those who are, is it really that simple to be human? Here's the reality, it's not. Being an immigrant, a refugee, and a human above all, the person next to you, who more than likely not has that immigrant story, can tell you. And I can tell you, because 22 years ago, my parents came from China to here for hope, and they found that it wasn't simple. Writing 20 papers and waiting eight years to obtain a green card were some things that many of their friends had to go through. And even after those eight years, one may have to wait in fear that someday they'll be taken. America, like my, friend, my, like my parents came here for, is that place for hope. Yet, while it is, it's being stripped away. Every year, around only 675,000 immig immigrants out of millions are allowed in the U.S. Within those legal boundaries, there is at least a one-year wait, years only getting longer. International borders are filled with anguish. DACA may be gone within the next four years. 
All of that laced with violence, assault, misinformation, and most, a lack of true awareness. Human rights that include moving in and out of the US, though everyone has them, they're being taken away. 70 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights marks that, but most, it marks the call for action. So what can we, especially as the youth, do? Like any issue, it's not overnight. But what we can do is recognize, more than know, understand. Think of what made you to who you are today. Who, how, why. To be an immigrant, a refugee, the connection between both, what does that mean to you? To answer these roots, we must take a look at three aspects, the past, the present, and the future. And from these three aspects comes three steps we can take, awareness, acquisition, and action. Now, we all know what immigration is, the basic concept, yet do we all know the nearly 130-year history of it or what the U.S.'s role in it was? How does someone really get into the United States, and why does that legal process take so long, and why does it matter? This is where awareness in the form of education comes in to answer these questions. We live in LA with one of the greatest diversities and highest immigrant populations nationally. This is why educating ourselves, especially of our past and our immigration stories, is so important. Now, the first step of awareness usually goes underlooked. Yet realize that in a few years, most high schoolers can vote. And that's a huge milestone, a huge right. The voter turnout for adults ages 18 to 29 this recent midterm election has been the lowest, primarily not due to a lack of will, passion, and intent, but more due to a lack of awareness, and specifically education. Within four years, where most of youth high schoolers will be 18, there will be policies surrounding immigration and how refuge is handled. If we are truly aware of that history, especially as part of a U.S. humanities curriculum, starting from elementary school, we can be able to take that education and apply it to understanding. Awareness is also important to immigrants themselves. Many at migrant shelters, prisons, etc., are not fully educated of the, of the basic constitutional rights in America, especially when they are fleeing from a desperate situation. Alongside rights, a guide of the basic U.S. economic system, including results of paying taxes once, for example, work sponsors are granted, is pivotal, especially in their respective languages. Their understanding will shape that of ours. From this comes step two of acquisition. How can we use what we know to understand? Right now, 30,000 people on average have to wait at the U.S.-Mexico border as day by day, less than 100 cases are taken. Violence at the border and even outside where the journey of getting here meets sexual assault, present events that may not occur within our borders are still important to know. This is why we need to acquire what we know with present time events through systems as education and what we can start, clubs, by acquiring our awareness into a continuous curriculum to center learning not just on the past, but on the present as well, we can spread step three of action. Action comes in many forms, and now it seems that protests are the only way. While at times they are effective, there are small things that sometimes matter the most, which we can do. Economic boycotts, like knowing where you tip and if that restaurant supports immigrating rights or on social media, including how you express yourself or who you follow if they degrade rights. Reconsider how you view these and communicate with your peers, with others on innovation, connecting to technology for the social good. On, for example, protest apps or signs. Spread the fact that in a few years, many will be able to vote. That itself, the right to vote, is a powerful action and unfortunately is one many don't recognize. Most of all, in these steps, we must look past this cloud of fear, 
call for immigrants and refugees to be expressed in a way not the same as media or our administration. Within America's economy, immigrants even undocumented have increased our GDP and will. Understand those aspects and broaden your cultural lens. Relating to the US government, the administration, specifically our president, has mentioned that he would like to secure America by building a wall. However, there is already a mental, emotional wall. If we can break that image, that wall of fear, we as the youth can change the worldly conversation. And I'd like to end with one thing. Let someone know. Let someone know what you have grasped today in all our panelist issues and take that one step further. Write a letter, do those small things, ask questions, communicate with your educators, and really dig deep to yourself on who you are, because ultimately that will affect who others will be. Those three steps, being truly aware, acquiring that awareness, and turning it into action, a change is made. Starting in your community and LA, you are all here because you can make that change. To be human isn't simple. We exist, we breathe, we are, yet we aren't. In the 70th year of the Human Rights Declaration, despite 70 as a universally lucky number, it is still not simple to be human. Yet we, the posterity, can change that. After all, we are human, and our thoughts, ideas, abilities to be, that's what is not simple. Thank you. Well, this is such a big issue. Um, yes. uh, first of all, I think, uh, and I think all of us have this experience that uh, when immigrants come into our lives, that are they bring culture, they bring uh, knowledge, they bring energy, mm -hmm. uh, ambition sometimes, and uh, uh, and kind of uh, high levels that all of us should aspire to. But I think when we think about uh, the problem, which is an, an, an international problem, not just a problem for the United States of America. And uh, I think we have uh, short memories uh, because I often think, uh, just take for instance, Latin America and Mexico. Uh, when I went to Spain and I went to one of the palaces that had belonged to a Duke of Spain and I looked at the wall and there was gold wallpaper. I thought, that's what they did with the gold? They put it on the wall? <laughs> <laughs> and if we would think of all of, all of the countries, Africa, Latin America, all of the countries that have been exploited in the past, and uh, when you think so many of the refugees that are going, say, now from Africa to Europe, actually, the European countries got their wealth from Africa. They got their wealth from Latin America. So it's kind of payback time, you know, uh, with interest. <laughs> and if they did that, then I, I don't, we would not have the kind of poverty because we know that when people migrate, uh, they do it because, uh, because they have to, because they, they are fleeing poverty, they're fleeing, fleeing terror, they're fleeing death, and they're, they're you know, surviving for their families. So uh, we have to take a, a, have a whole, have to kind of uh, take a whole other uh, narrative for immigrants. And going back to Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, uh, who of course was our United, first United Nations United Nation ambassador for, for refugees, and uh, kind of rethink that and, and uh, rebrand it, and, and think that refugees are the people that bring vitality and life to a country, and uh, think about how we can make life better for refugees everywhere. Chris. Um, I also just wanted to contribute as someone from the entertainment industry, uh, I think empathy is such an important aspect that in a way we've almost stigmatized the word immigrant in a sense and I think that um, I would just wanted to offer that I would I can't really think of very many stories that are positive about exactly what you're saying Dolores in terms of like the contributions that it really brings and so I'm just gonna have a little call to action to myself to say, to, um, to increase conversation, and it, but also inside of the entertainment industry to say, how do we tell stories that are not of just 
drug cartels and the negative things that are exported and, and that travel around the world, but the incredible, resilient, amazing stories and contributions that people have made because I think a lot of times people don't know to care unless it's their personal experience, unfortunately. And then I think it also goes back to what you were saying, Ford, as far as education. Um, I, I know for myself, I'm from South Carolina, and when I started doing international work, my mother was kind of mad at me. Like, do you know how many stuff, how many things are happening right here in our neighborhood, and you're going to go all the way to Africa to do something? <laughs> I'm like, but mom, like, kids are kids everywhere, you know, people. And I think that we don't have that, that, um, that sense of, of real stories that can actually relate to us. So I think that's a, a place that we can look as well. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, thank you so much for your insight. It's really something that's important. And going back what uh, our panelists mentioned about um, looking through a different perspective, to the audience, I do encourage you to do that because there is this stigma surrounding immigrants and refugees and how it's primarily something that's negative, that's not Na that's not international, and as Mr. Laura said, it is something international, and really the person, the right of moving in and out of the U.S. and any other countries, it's really important to grasp a different perspective. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are on Tongva land, that we, this is stolen Tongva land. Um, and I also want to say that my name is Thomas and that my pronouns are he, him, his, and they, them, theirs. Um, I also want to say I'm a Sagittarius moon, um, <laughs> a Virgo rising, and a Pisces moon. Oh my God, so um, and I'm currently a senior at Gravelino High School, and I'm here to advocate for the human rights issue of LGBTQI equality. This means bringing lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and inter intersex quality um, to every corner of the world. I'm queer. Um, that's something I haven't always felt comfortable saying. Um, unspeakable homophobic slurs from elementary and middle school peers traumatized me um, until <laughs> it traumatized me and kept me in the closet until eighth grade. Um, when I finally came out, I was still insecure with my sexuality and my gender identity. Um, and now as a high school senior, I think I'm as comfortable as I can be with my identities. Um, however, there are certain instances um, that trigger my insecurities. Um, two weeks ago, my school was hosting a blood drive and I was really excited because um, I was finally able to donate blood um, without parental permission. Um, but that's when I realized that I couldn't donate blood. Um, so, stuck between the choices of man and woman, I would have to choose the identity closest to mine, a man. And according to the FDA, um, those who identify as men and have sex with other men must wait a 12-month referral period before donating blood. So when I remembered this discriminatory policy, I felt dirty. I felt like my blood was not unnatural, it wasn't adequate, and it wasn't equal to that of straight and cisgender people. All blood, the universal liquid that all humans share, is not deemed equal by the United States and many countries across the world. A mass shooting at a popular gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida, claimed the lives of 49 people, those of whom were predominantly um, LGBTQI and Latinx. Um, when there was a need for blood to be donated for victims of violent homophobia, Queer men, in particular, were denied the right to save one of their community members' life because of homophobia. Human rights are important to me because my community is often subject to seizure of human rights. In local, state, national, and international settings, the LGBTQI community does not have the right to exist, the right to love, or the right to expression. Having sex with a same-sex partner is illegal in 72 countries across the globe. Intersex people only have 
explicit protections for their right to bodily autonomy in four countries in the world. Transgender women, disproportionately trans women of color, are regularly being murdered in the United States. 20% of all youth in the juvenile justice system in the United States are, L are lesbian, gay, and bisexual, and they lack access to health care and supportive services. There are too many statistics and examples in the world that demonstrate how dire this human rights issue is. Throughout, most, throughout my search for a solution for LGBTQI issues, I never realized that the answer was right in front of me. This event is called the Youth Solution Summit. We are gathered here today because youth are change makers and problem solvers. Thank you all for being here. You're, you are all the solution. Involving yourself in organizing for the issues that you believe in and being allies for other interconnected issues are both actions that you can take. Um, before I continue, I want to acknowledge the youth that can't be here today, um, but are being affected by human rights issues the most. Um, the youth asylum seekers in Tijuana, the youth still being separated from their families at the border, the youth prisoners fighting our fires, the youth of Palestine, the homeless and incarcerated LGBTQI youth in Los Angeles, the undocumented youth fearing for their safety, and the numerous black and indigenous youth at home and abroad who are being robbed, silenced, violated, traumatized, and brutalized. We can see that youth are often most impacted by human rights issues. We can see that youth have, all, but, and we can also see that youth have always been at the forefront of taking leadership positions and pushing for system change in their communities. In 1989, 700 Brazilian street children took over the Brazilian National Congress and pressured them to adopt protections for youth and children in their national constitution. I believe that the same can be accomplished in other countries in the world and here in the United States. If youth have the power, resources, access, and voice to participate in change making and create LGBTQI equality, they will. In California, LGBTQI youth organizers have worked to draft protections for LGBTQI students and have fought for history education and sex education that reflects their culture and needs. They have advocated and mobilized for LGBTQI competency training and all gender bathrooms in their schools. Youth organizing is proven to be effective, um, but it's futile without necessary support. We need to invest in youth and youth organizing. Adults can invest in youth by providing philanthropic support to organizations that directly support youth social justice organizing. Adults can make spaces like these safe and accessible to homeless youth, disabled youth, and undocumented youth. Adults can use their privilege to uplift the voice of LGBTQI youth in their communities and lobby local governments and school boards to implement youth commissions and youth representation in their proceedings. Most importantly, youth, most importantly, adults can mobilize other adults to be allies for youth. We must recognize that youth today are not only lining up to become more civically engaged by winning seats in government and participating to vote, they are also pushing for permanent systemic change in their organizing. They have been in the past, are in the present, and will be in the future. My name is Thomas, and I'm here to recruit you into a movement that will deliver more than just LGBTQI equality for all. It's a youth movement that will deliver intersectional liberation, justice, and equity to the streets, cities, the nation, and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jason, let's start with you. Well, Thomas, I just want to say great job. And I, too, am a Sagittarius, so <laughs> <laughs> we have that in common as well. That's what you took from that. Yeah. <laughs> I was just inspired by your energy. And thank you for sharing uh, your story and then also your plan. Um, something that I just want to you know, touch upon is, uh, for some people who don't know in the room, I think it's over 30 states in our country that it's absolutely legal to fire someone for being uh, gay, for being a member of the LGBTQI community. Um, so as Dolores was talking earlier about uh, legislation with regards to women's rights, we need to have the Equality Act passed. And um, under our current administration, I don't know if that's gonna happen, but with you um, pushing and leading the charge and then also getting those allies from the, whether they're adults or from the straight community. Um, it's all about, you know, I'm going to use that whole uh, sports analogy about just getting a bigger team, a stronger team, 
So you have that fire, that energy, but then you need to reach out to uh, whether it's in something that you talked about, intersectionality, uh, getting, whether it's women's rights. Uh, you talked about um, Black Lives Matters a little bit there. Um, just all other groups that we all need to push together to force um, policy change and legislation because, as Dolores said, we are a country of laws. Um, and something that uh, also that the people in the room might not realize, but being a member of the community, when you travel internationally, the first thing that I look up is, is this a country that practices Sharia law? I remember uh, wanting to go to the uh, Maldives. Uh, does people know it's, it's a beautiful, it's like a paradise on earth. However, um, they practice Sharia law there, and I was very worried being an openly gay man, um, would I be safe there? And that's something that, um, again, that we need to work on internationally is making sure that uh, creating those safe spaces around the world and making sure that people feel welcome in, uh, in every walk of life. Um, so just keep up that energy and just keep up um, it's, it is inspiring and keep inspiring people. Yeah, I would love to speak on this. Um, so first of all, thank, thank you. you. I thought you did an excellent job as well. Um, from your opening statement um, and your acknowledgments throughout, you, you spoke to people that have historically been excluded and who are not present in the room. Mm. And I think that is incredibly powerful. Um, you, you used your time and your capital and your power in this moment to sort of lift the voices of, of others. Mm -hmm. And I think that is ultimately what leaders do and what everyone in this room is doing in their own way um, by being part of this conversation, by representing a specific view, but by holding others in that, in that ultimate goal. Um, I also appreciated the Harvey Milk reference, so nicely done overall. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm on the board of Equality California, and uh, this organization uh, has actually passed many, many laws in the state of California, and I think to everybody here in the audience that it's important that we participate in all of these. Uh, we talked about the Black Lives Matter movement, of course, uh, the women's marches, the Me Too, et cetera. But we have pride marches every year in Los Angeles and throughout the country. And I'm really happy to report that Bakersfield, California, we had our first pride march ever <laughs> last year. And, so, and also, you know, to, uh, to kind of be informed, uh, to see what laws are being, uh, you know, what laws are being uh, dealt with in Sacramento or in Washington, D.C., uh, and, uh, and communicate with your relatives in other states. We know we, when we talk about immigrants, we have a lot of immigrants to California from you know, other places like Texas and, and some of those other states where uh, we can also inform and uh, organize our friends and relatives in those states to also be supportive of our LGBT uh, community. Uh, you all may, may know that Matthew Shepard, uh, who was killed in Wyoming uh, because he was gay, that uh, they just uh, had a celebration of his life and his remains are going to be at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So, in, and in your schools, uh, tell your teachers to show the video of Matthew Shepard in his life, uh, to show uh, the video of Emmett Till, a young teenager, uh, African-American who was killed, uh, who was from Chicago but killed in Mississippi because he supposedly whistled at a white woman. So I think in all the work that we do, uh, you know, keeping with the themes of human rights uh, that the United Nations is, of course, uh, trying to promote with everyone, that, uh, you know, we do our own uh, work that we need to do in our schools so that we can educate the students that may be, not be aware uh, of these lives, you know, and how their human, their human rights were violated to the point that they were killed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just, I'm an organizer and I want everybody, everybody to be an organizer, all right? So let's, let's just make that commitment to be organizers for human rights. Um, I think um, 
one of the panel's points, um, they, it, they all glossed over um, intersectionality, and I wanna um, reemphasize how important intersectionality is. Um, for example, um, Emmett Till whistled at a white woman. Um, he was black, um, but also he was disabled. Um, his disability caused him to allegedly whistle at the white woman. And when we don't include um, like certain aspects like that um, in our education or like in our, um, in our curriculum, and we don't include that in our organizing, it's impossible to reach um, liberation. It's impossible to get equality. Um, and on a vision of intersectionality, um, I just want everyone to know that all our issues are connected and none of them are separated. And that's why I included everything in this speech because our liberation is interse intersectional and that's what I wanted to share. Yeah. The United Nations Association and it is such an awesome opportunity to be able to see young people here in Los Angeles taking action for human rights. And I just want to thank all of you for being here today. It's truly an amazing opportunity that you have to be here today, one, but it's an amazing opportunity because we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and you are truly a part of that history making. I want to just take an opportunity to thank a few folks uh, here, uh, one of which is uh, your discussion leaders in, in your tables, um, our lovely students from USC and our uh, you know, chapter leaders from UCLA, they have been instrumental in helping us with this event, so thank you all for, for your contributions to make this event happen. I also just want to take a moment to thank the, the staff from the UN Foundation that has been really helpful throughout this uh, planning process for the event. They're surrounded uh, around this room, but let's give them a round of applause as well. And then of course, our friends here at Los Angeles City Hall, Mayor Garcetti, they have been so generous uh, in their hospitality for allowing us to be here today. And of course, we thank Mayor Garcetti for everything that he's done to advocate for human rights, and we encourage uh, Los Angeles to continue being a champion for human rights for many years to come. Thank you, Mayor Garcetti and LA City Hall. And enough, but thank all of you for being here. You as young people, you, you are truly the next generation of leaders, and I'm, I'm starstruck myself. I want to thank our human rights ambassadors who were absolutely amazing. If you can please stand up so we can give you a stand. We are a grassroots network of advocates, advocating for a strong U.S.-U.N. relationship. And now more than ever, we need young people like you to take action for the U.N. And so as, as high school students, as college students, you have the opportunity to, to subscribe to our network for free. So I definitely encourage you to do so. Visit UNAUSA.org. We have so many opportunities for young people to participate in events like this across the country. So definitely subscribe to our network because we want to give you the platform to take action. And I also want to encourage you now to take out your cell phones. So take them out. And we're going to do some action taking right now. As you know, we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of the UDHR, but we also want to celebrate our commitment to human rights. And so right now, I want you to make the pledge to stand up for human rights. We, were, we are gathered here today to celebrate the 70th anniversary, to stand up for human rights, to have a conversation, but now you are going to go out into your communities and truly take the light 
and stand up for human rights. And so I want you to text the word pledge to the number 738-674. And by doing so, you will be committing to human rights. And this is the pledge the office of the UN, the UN Human Rights Office has asked us to encourage Americans across the country to engage in. And by signing the pledge, you are committing to respect the rights of everyone, regardless of who they are, to uphold the rights even when, you may dis even when people disagree with you. And you are also pledging that when anyone's rights are denied, everyone's rights are undermined, so you will stand up. And lastly, by pledging your commitment to human rights, you're pledging to commit your voice, that you will take action, and that you will use your rights to stand up for others. So please, once again, text the word pledge to the, to the number 738-674, and you will be making that pledge for human rights today. Thank you again for being here and for participating in this awesome Youth Solution Summit. The last thing that I'm going to ask of you is, obviously, you have a beautiful bag that you created with a flickering candle. And so as, as the, dawn, as the uh, sun sets here in Los Angeles, we want to encourage you to take that light and to shine your light on human rights in your community, in your family, in your school, in your churches, synagogues, mosques, wherever you take action for human rights, we want you to shine that light for human rights wherever you go. And so we're going to ask you to actually um, display your bags here for, for us to see your commitment to human rights. Um, we do have uh, bookshelves located up here on the stage and also downstairs. Please place your bag so that we can see that shining light. And of course, take that symbolic light in your, in your hearts and minds so that you can take action for human rights in your communities. Thank you again, and have a great night.